way I would put what I talk about is I'm talking about digital citizenship, media literacy, and digital portfolios. And I have a fundamental belief that we can't actually teach that in our schools unless we're teaching social media. Um, so anyone who thinks they're, they're doing digital citizenship curriculum, if you're not getting through to, if you're not using social media, you're not talking about social media, you're not getting through to kids. Um, so uh, obviously we're going to look at those concepts through a social media lens. Um, and I want to talk about the problems that we're having with social media in schools, but then also solutions. Um, and I, I have an agenda slide that will come up in a sec. But let's start with a fun activity. Um, it goes like this. I'm going to put a word up here. And if you know what it is, you just stay seated. If you don't know what it is, stand up and go find someone who is seated, who knows what it is, and ask them. Okay? So, everyone understand? Let's give it a shot. Uh, number one is Finsta. If you know what it is, stay seated. If you don't, go ask someone who's sitting. And all of that, to start this session, to start with a very, very important point, which is you don't have to know what any of these things are to make a major impact in our students' lives and social media and make a major impact on society um, by extension, by, by teaching our kids a little bit about social media. So I'm starting this by being like, you, this should not deter you. Um, in fact, you don't need to know any of this um, for you to, to go out of this session you know, empowered to, to make a difference in this space. So this is just for fun. So this is what I want to do again. I want to talk about that intersection of education and social media. And as I said, I want to talk about problems from sort of how we see it with our teenagers um, and then how it is affecting our society uh, and then the solutions. Uh, what should we do? And what does it look like? And I got a couple more activities to try to keep it interesting for you, uh, which I hope I can do. So um, what's here? I want to start with this, which is we're at an ed tech conference and there is a fortune in ed tech right now. So whether it's our schools that are buying devices for our kids or our families that are buying devices for the kids, you know, whatever, or it's the, um, there's 13 unicorns up there because in the last five years, we've put $13 billion into ed tech startups. A lot of money. Um, so that money uh, in educational technology, uh, we see it in the last few days at this conference. And to me, uh, I think of that and I say, well, are we really thinking this through? Because whatever's happening across the hall or down the hall, like I'm positive that that teacher using that piece of ed tech is doing something amazing. Um, but is every other teacher that's trying to use that piece of tech? And then, when our kids leave our schools, are they using that app to create something cool or engage with a classmate? And I don't really think so. Um, so I think we're missing this gigantic opportunity, which is, we're going to give them these devices, and then they're not going to use them the way we want them to. And we seem to be okay with that. Um, and that bothers me a little bit. Uh, and again, we'll also we'll spare no expense, our school, at least my school, to bring in an ed tech consultant to talk about using ed tech in the classroom. Um, we'll spare no expense for that. But we won't even consider um, doing that same thing for what our students are spending a massive amount of their time doing, actually doing with the tech we give them, which is social media. Um, and so we're put, pumping all this money, um, and it's going to some tech billionaires, and none of them let their kids use technology. Steve Jobs and Bill Gates famously did or do set limits on screen time for their kids. And Mark Zuckerberg talks about how he doesn't want his kids on tech, he wants to read books, right? So the joke is, is on us and all the money we're putting into this. And then our posture towards social media, which is where they're spending their time in the ed tech that we're giving them, is this. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. We don't want anything to do with what our kids are doing in social media spaces. And that is totally bizarre to me because that's where they're spending their time. So, my school, I, I work at a private school, a high school, and if someone messes up on social media, we kick them out, and then we go back to this posture again. And we're always reactive, um, and we're not doing anything with this. So I can't understand, I can't square the circle of like, we're giving these kids all this technology, and then where they're using it, we're just, we're like, ah, oh, we don't care. But when they're in my classroom, we're doing something really cool. Right? So that trade-off, uh, it, it can't stand uh, for that much longer. Um, so I'm hoping to push the, we'll get the ball rolling with more people using social media and thinking about social media and helping our kids in that space because we're giving them the tech. We're telling them they have to get online to do their homework. We're telling them they have to get on YouTube to learn something. Right? We're getting them on Google. Right? We're doing all of this, and we're not teaching it. Um, and so that makes me a little conflicted, too. Because my journey to becoming a technology instructional coach at my school came from the fact that when I got out of college, 
I fell in love with Twitter and my PLN and educators on Twitter that made me a better educator. So I was using social media to learn about ed tech, right? But that also went both ways. Whereas learning more about ed tech from being on social media and vice versa, and it was exciting. Um, and so I'm, this is my last point on ed tech, but if you say bold educators are using ed tech, I'd say that's old. That was 10 years ago that I graduated from college and fell in love with the ed tech hashtag. Totally fell in love with it. And it made me a better teacher and has done so much for me to this day. Um, but you know, integrating a new app in the classroom, I don't, I don't call that bold. And again, I think the people in this audience and the people at this conference are doing amazing work with that. But as a, as a you know, for our teenagers and for our society, I think we're presenting, with, presenting them with more problems than we are solutions. Um, so this, that gave me so much, finding this in the personalized learning network and becoming a better teacher because of it, um, made me think. And this gets to sort of my solution. If I can build a PLN to become a better teacher, can my students build a PLN to get good at whatever they love, whatever they're passionate about, whatever they want to get good at? So I put that thesis to the test, and I built this website where I said to my students, you tell me what you're passionate about, and I'll spit back to you. Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts, YouTube accounts, newsletters, podcasts, Instagram accounts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera so that you can build up a personalized learning network and get, it good, get good at something you love. And so this is uh, a real quick tour of it. It's not perfect. But if you tell it you're interested in, say, um, technology, uh, it'll spit back to you um, Twitter and Facebook accounts, YouTube accounts to follow, podcasts to listen to, uh, Instagram accounts to follow. And that same thing would be true if you're not sure what you're passionate about, but you're like, my favorite class is my science class. I say, well, if you love your science class, here's where you can learn more about science. From Twitter to Facebook to YouTube to podcasts, Instagram, you know, and so on. I put that to the test, and I strongly believe that the key to it is that a kid truly has to be passionate about what he or she is searching. That's the short version of the solution where I want to get us. Um, and it's going to take some scaffolding for, for me to get all of us there. Um, but if we can truly pique our kids' interests and help them build these networks, and they start to learn from, collaborate with, create and share with professionals in professional spaces in ways that they know that are gonna benefit them in college and beyond, we don't have to worry so much about cyberbullying. We don't have to worry so much about media literacy. Right, so actually we can solve some of those problems, those you know, basic problems that we're dealing with um, by helping them use social media differently. So again, I view social media as the solution to the problems that we're having with digital citizenship, media literacy, and digital portfolios in our schools. So I put this to the test, um, and I'm going to have you do it in a second, too. I taught a new class this year. I call it Internet and Inequality. And it's about all the ways that big tech and AI and so on and so forth is causing massive gaps in our society. And I said, if a kid truly loves my content in this class, what he or she would do is follow or subscribe to these 11 newsletters, follow these 232 people on Twitter, or follow my list, um, and listen to maybe these 11 podcasts. I was like, if you do that, um, you don't need me. I mean, I'm gonna get you started, we're gonna work together, we're gonna learn together, don't get me wrong. Um, but when the class ends, your learning doesn't end, and if you love this, you can get good at it uh, beyond your time with me. And I've also done this in my history classes, I'm a former history teacher, um, and I was able to do this there, too, which I'll uh, explore more later. And I used to teach a journalism class uh, called Mass Media that I also did this in that I'll share with you in a little bit as well. So it's not just an elective. It's not just a new class like this. I think we can do this anywhere. So when I talk at schools about this, it usually takes a lot of scaffolding um, for us to do what I just said. But this is ISTE, um, and it's the last day, and I'm going to ask you to give me everything you got here. Could you do this um, for your course or, or a peer's course or, or whatever it is? So I say, think of it like this. When I went to college, my professors would have this extra section in the syllabus that's called additional readings. And they'd be like, hey, we don't have time to get through all this stuff, but if you liked it, here's some more things to read. And I didn't read any of it. None of it. But if they had said, here's 10 experts in this area, in this field, for some of those, some of those syllabi, I'm like, no, I'm not interested in trash. But for some of them, my favorite classes and my favorite professors, if they were like, here's where you can learn more about this, I'm like, yeah, I want to learn more. And I don't want it to stop. Right? It would be in real time updates of this uh, you know, industry or, or, or subject or whatever forever. 
So could we do that for our current courses? And I actually want to give you sort of three or four minutes to actually try this. And hopefully uh, we can get ourselves to a position where you understand uh, the solution or where I'm trying to get us over the next 40 minutes um, right, right away. All right, cool? Go ahead. But I did hear a lot of people that were able to get somewhere with this. Um, I heard Latin, that one was tough, but we got somewhere with that. I also heard English, we got somewhere with that. So I think everyone sort of, sort of kind of gets where I am. And for those of you that were perusing the website, um, by all means, use that as a starter. But again, I think it's really powerful if teachers do that on their own. And it's really important to also note, your kids might not want to follow your lists, you know, subscribe to your newsletters and, and, and listen to your podcasts, but they might for their science class or for a different class, right? So it's not, some, it's not for our kids to do this in every class. It's the ones that they love, um, that they should continue learning about. Um, you know, and that actually brings me to section two. I want to talk about social media and teens, but I'm going to do a Simon Sinek and take a step back and talk about why for a second. The best schools graduate kids that are good people and lifelong learners. And that's what we demand they be when they come into our class. I think that's, I think that's a blanket. Everyone would agree with that. Um, we want kids coming to our class as good citizens and lifelong learners, right? So I think it's totally bizarre that we don't care if they do this once they get into digital spaces. So as soon as they open their computer, as soon as they look at their phone, we don't actually care or, or try to help them become good citizens and lifelong learners in that space. So when I first started making these presentations, I'd sort of start with this. I'd say, social media helps create more, informed citizens, political participation, equitable economic opportunity, understanding of other cultures, or all of the above. Should be all of the above, but guess what? It's actually none of the above. So if we're sharing fake news and misinformation, um, and if we are, you know, maybe more politically active with hashtags, but, you know, are we really acting that much? I mean, the, the dysfunction we have in Washington would lead me to believe no. Our voting numbers are, are lower than it has been in history, too. Equitable economic opportunities, absolutely not. I mean, the amount of companies traded on stock exchange is way down. Small businesses are down. And mergers and acquisitions are up. Understanding of other cultures, I mean, build the wall, Muslim ban, no way. So actually, this is none of the above. Uh, but it should be all of the above. And if I was really cruel, I would preface this slide with talking about the Arab Spring. I'm like, oh, look at what the power of social media. And we all fell in love with it. Um, and now, you know, we're in this like wasteland of this space. Um, so it's none of the above, but we need to make it all of the above. And it can be all of the above. But we're going to have to work as educators, and we're going to have to actually get into this space um, to get there. Um, so let's talk about how to do that. Um, and this was my character education, lifelong learning follow-up slide. It's in the wrong spot, but are we getting character education? Are we getting lifelong learning? This is the commons at my school. Like, no way. I have no clue what they're doing in that space. We're not asking them. We're at, we ask them to do something when they come to the classroom, but you know, in this space, who knows? Who cares? We don't, we don't care. But we do know um, that, especially our younger people, from 18 to 29, 39% um, of them say they're online, quote unquote, almost constantly. So what would that be for our teenagers? Even higher. So they're spending all their time online. And I'm going to fast forward through some stats. Whether that's 6.3 hours a day, according to Mary Meeker, 12 hours and 9 minutes a day, according to eMarketer, or 11 hours and 6 minutes a day, according to Nielsen. We're spending a lot of time consuming media. How can you get 12 hours a day? Well, we're multitasking, so we're double counting a lot of the time. It's crazy, these numbers. And back in 2015, Common Sense Media said 9 hours a day consuming media. So it's probably more than this now, but let's just take this as a given. I mean, if we could get this number down, like, I'm in favor of that. But I'm operating in this presentation on the fact that it is at best nine, um, and what are we going to do with it? And, and, and for lack of a better word, we need to inject that with some art and culture. It's a learning. It's our job as teachers, right? So let's, let's do that. How do we do that? Well, start here. Of that nine hours, Common Sense Media found that only 3% of those nine hours was content creation. Another way to put that is 97% of the time they were just consuming. Just scrolling, just watching TV. And if we're talking about at an ed tech conference about how powerful ed tech is and it can create immersive experiences in VR and, and all this creativity and cool stuff, that's not what, that's not what they're doing. Right? And this was 2015, I bet it's worse. Do you know what they're doing? Have you ever seen a 16 year old girl on Snapchat? I'm not saying that's bad or that's all bad. You can be social on social media. You should be social on social media. 
Um, but I wonder about it, and I'm just going to leave it at that. This is one of my students, uh, a, this was a sophomore boy in the spring of last year or two years ago, using the app Moment to record what he did on his screen. Hour and eight, 18 minutes playing balls, 55 minutes on Snapchat, 32 minutes on his home and lock screen, yada, 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 up for five hours and 20 minutes uh, on May 22nd. Probably should have been studying for exams, but this is what his day on his phone looked like. So maybe these are extreme, right? And I don't, I'm not saying this kid shouldn't play games. I'm not saying that girl shouldn't be social. I'm just pointing out, this is where our teenagers are in social media spaces, and we are not involved at all. We're just totally out of it. And, and we're trying to rely on parents to do this, and they're also not equipped to handle this, but that's a story for another presentation. So more broadly, that's sort of individually what our teens are doing here. More broadly, what's it doing in our society? And by the, this picture, you probably know how I feel about it. It's a train wreck. This is the internet to our students. Anything social that they do on the internet is through Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and maybe Snapchat. Anything they want to know on the internet, they get through Google or YouTube. And anything they want to buy, they get through Amazon. So our internet is down to three companies. They hire the best coders in the world, and those coders do everything they can to get us on their apps, mine as much data about us as they can, so they can perfect an algorithm to keep us on their apps. And in Tristan Harris's word, they travel down the brainstem to hook us, time on site, and make money. Because a truism about the internet nowadays is that it's not information that's scarce, which we as educators, like maybe when we were in school, information was the scarcity, but now information is abundant, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere online. So actually the scarce resource, the infinite variable, if you will, is actually attention. So everything is competing for their attention. Your homework assignment competes for their attention with texting and Snapchat and Instagram and gaming and Amazon buying some yada, yada, yada. They're all multitasking, we know that. We are gonna lose, and we are losing <laughs> this battle right now. Um, especially when, as I said, the best and, best and brightest minds go out to the Silicon Valley to use psychological tricks to, right? They're gonna win, and they do. But the other thing about this that I need to say that um, connects to that internet and inequality class I was talking about earlier is the problems that are coming up in this, yeah, like, you know, cyberbullying, being manipulated by algorithms, you know, so on and so forth. These are, these are problems, absolutely. But the lens that I view it through is actually what's doing it is creating inequality in our society. So it's inequality of access, um, literacy, I mean, how we understand these things and how it works for us, uh, epistemic inequality, and, and you can read the slide uh, if you want it, I'll send it to you. And the ones in bold I'm gonna talk about in a little more detail, so let's start with literacy. Um, as I was just saying, multitasking, from that same Common Sense Media survey. And there are people from Common Sense Media here, shout out, um, thanks for the survey. Two thirds of teens who multitask say they don't think that watching TV, texting, or using social media while doing homework makes any difference in the quality of their work. Obviously, we know science, where, you know, it, it drastically affects their work. Some, a study from the University of London said it can lower your IQ by up to 15 points. Um, Stanford said that multitaskers perform worse organizing, filtering out information, switching tasks, the American Psychological Association said when you switch tasks, it can cost you about 40% of your productive time. Um, and this is back from Mary Meeker again. She found that 88% of adults, uh, actually from a Nielsen report, 88% of adults say they use a second screen when they watch TV. So we're all doing it. Um, and we all think we can do it, and we can't. And science says we can't, and we don't tell them that. So literacy, yeah. We also are getting our information and our news from social media. These are the numbers for Facebook, 43, YouTube, 21, Twitter, 12. And Gen Z, like our students, 59% of them cite YouTube as their preferred learning tool. And get this, we're complicit in that. How many times do you assign a YouTube video to your students for homework? What that implies is that you can learn quality stuff on YouTube. But you know what else YouTube does? It runs an algorithm like the Silicon Valley stuff I was talking about earlier that pushes you more extreme with every click down the rabbit hole. Um, and there was an article in the New York Times last week or two weeks ago that's just phenomenal um, by Kevin Roots about someone who started clicking on YouTube videos and became totally radicalized into the alt-right. Um, and that's not surprising. Um, the way Zainab Tufekci says it, she says, well, if you click on a video because you're interested in, in starting to run or, or going for a run or jog, soon enough they'll recommend traveling for mar doing marathons and then doing all these other crazy fitness things. 
right? Or if you're like, hey, I might be interested in being a vegetarian. Well, then they recommend you a vegan, and then they recommend, right? Like, that's what it does. It, make, it pushes you extreme. That's how the YouTube algorithm works. It's terrifying that it can radicalize people. Um, it also was connecting pedophiles. So pedophiles were leaving comments on YouTube videos to help other pedophiles find children in these videos. And so YouTube would recommend it to more of them. It's terrible. It's horrible. Um, and you know, sometimes the worst things happen out of that radicalization. So I lose sleep at night thinking about the fact that I tell my kids to learn on YouTube, but then I also know YouTube does these awful things for society. Um, and don't even get me started on YouTube kids. And that's epistemic inequality, which is like how we know. So if you were to go to a Flat Earth conference, yes, they have those. Every single session would end with, do your own research. Because confirmation bias is a hell of a drug. And if you say, is the world flat, YouTube tells you the world's flat. Um, and of course, you know, misinformation and polarization and all that stuff is, is, is right and happening right on YouTube, right in front of our faces. And this is a, a piece of data from the Harvard Berkman Klein Center. Um, shout out, right? Didn't you work for them? Yeah. What they found is that our left and our center left and our center were talking to each other in social media spaces, but our right had just catapulted away and only talked to themselves in an echo chamber. And right, left, we all end up in echo chambers. Um, so our kids are actively falling into these echo chambers, and we're going, eh, not interested. And then AI is also causing us major problems for um, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, whether it's um, risk, risk assessment tools sentencing people and then sentencing black defendants differently than they would white defendants, or Facebook's ad system, which allows you to target your ads towards people of different gender and race. And even though they said they fixed that, they didn't fix that. Um, and these researchers did this crazy thing that I want to share because this is so crazy. They put an ad on Facebook, and they put a perfume bottle in the ad. But then they rocked the transparency down to zero, so you can't actually see the perfume bottle at all. And they punched it into Facebook's ad system, and it sent that ad that has a perfume bottle that no one can see in it to 65% more women. So then they put in an ad for a lumberjack, and it went to like 80% males and then 70% white males, right? It's just like, so like Facebook's ad system is hard coded for this discrimination, even if they say that you can't explicitly target by gender and race. You can through proxies, and even if you're not using proxies, it's hard coded for it. And we're not talking about this in schools. And health, uh, let me do two quick slides on health. Um, insurance is trying to vacuum up everything that they can possibly find out about us to charge us more for our health insurance whether it's our purchases or what we post on Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, this is the percentages in, in Mary Meekers of um, social media, how many people have experienced you know, bullying online. And online, um, these social media spaces are causing our teens anxiety, stress, depression. Um, and this is a, a peek under the hood. This is my Evernote note on those studies. I mean, and there's an ample amount of studies of what social media is doing to our teenagers, and most of it's bad. So, so that I don't have to depress you anymore, uh, let's get up and chat. Um, here's what I want to do. Um, I realize that that's heavy, and, and trust me, the solutions are coming. They're the next section. But before we get to the next section, I hope that something from the last couple might have resonated with you. So I want to give you some time to get up and stand up and move to get your blood flowing again and meet someone else. Um, and I want you to do the thinking routine. I used to think, now I think. So let's get into solutions. And I'm, I'm, I'm in Philly, so I got some Philly memes for the last two sections. This is Charlotte Day. Oh, it's sunny. And what do we do? Well, I'm going to give you three, the three ways I put it when I talk at schools. Um, one is do over don't. Right? And I think now this is accepted. When I started doing these presentations, people were like shocked by that. But instead of saying don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, when we talk about our kids in tech, our kids in social media, we need to say what you should do is this. You know, positive reinforcement, um, positive qualities. And I, I want to connect this to the red one in the top corner, because I also have a red one in the top corner when I think about digital citizenship. So do over don't, digital citizenship. Two is we need to teach our kids to value veracity over virality. Um, so what is viral uh, is not necessarily uh, what is quality information, right? So how do we get them to value veracity over virality? That's media lit. And then three is create over spectate. This will be digital portfolios. How do we get our kids in these wonderful ed tech sessions we've had all around the building to continue to create outside of the classroom and create quality content, share it, put it into networks where other people are doing the same and, and get better at something they're passionate about. Um, how do we do that? Because remember that stat, 97% of the time, they're just consuming, they're just scrolling. So then here's how I would define those terms. 
digital citizenship. Um, common sense media would get mad because this is maybe too simple for them, but digital citizenship is the left side of the slide. If you are, if you are an active, informed citizen online, right, it is not um, you being a passive, entertained consumer when you get online. So it's a state of mind, and it's the state of mind, on, of mind when you get online. Sometimes it's okay to get online like, I'm wiped, I just want to watch some Gossip Girl and go to bed, and be a passive entertained consumer. Sometimes that's cool, right? But as a teacher, which one of these things do you want when the kid walks in the classroom? You want the active, informed citizen. In fact, you require it, you demand it, and you use carrots and sticks to make sure it happens. Why don't we do the same thing for them online? And this one's more complicated. It's hard to define media literacy, so I'm going to break it down for you in simple terms. Emojis. First, it's your state of mind. This is the passive entertained consumer, um, and we've got to get rid of that. So we've got to get the active, informed citizen there. And then secondly, and this is where you come in, we as teachers need to build these networks way bigger. Way bigger. Like that Twitter list, you know, the podcast, the things on my website. Like, just build it bigger. Inevitably, when you build a big network, you end up with some nefarious individuals, some evil individuals, some Russian propaganda, and some liars. <laughs> what do we do about those? Well, the way in which we should help our kids build it bigger is with groups of critical thinkers and experts that put out quality content about a student's passion. So if you're passionate about politics, group of critical thinkers would be like the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Politico, I don't know. Experts would be famous politicians, famous pundits, TV show hosts, etc. But we, we as teachers, we're smart enough and old enough to know that could we do that for every interest? Could I do that for my class, whatever I teach? And again, that's what I started with. I hope you can. And if you can, I'll help you. So let's build that much bigger. And I think that solves this problem. That the nefarious, evil, Russian propaganda liars, if our network is truly big enough, and it truly delivers quality content, groups of critical thinkers and experts about an area of interest, we don't have to worry about media literacy so much anymore, because what they see is quality information. And if some crap comes across their feed, someone's checking it an expert or a group of critical thinkers, right? Those people tend to not share fake news. Once in a while they do, tend to not share propaganda or Russian propaganda, once in a while maybe. But that stuff's always corrected, right? And all of a sudden this network that they're in is delivering quality content to them. And we don't have to ask them to go through the five C's or do a crap test on everything they see um, because of the network that they're in, right? So if we're trying to teach media literacy without talking about their social media networks, we're failing. So let's build that huge. How? Well, again, I started from, the, from point one about academic enrichment. I mean, if your kid loves your class, he or she should follow blank. But that could also be civic engagement, or that could be career readiness. We were talking about career. Um, so if you have a kid who really loves his or her club, or there's a cause that they're very passionate about, there is a network for them with groups of critical thinkers and experts that we need to guide them to. Think about your, the clubs you run, the teams you coach, right? Career readiness, same thing. If you have a kid who knows that he or she wants to do something when he grows up, if they're not already looking at what these experts do and what the you know, groups of critical thinkers that put out quality content in that area are doing, then, then we're leaving them behind. So we've got to help them do this. And we're teachers. This is what we're good at. Um, and then we've got to help them. That would help them be active, informed citizens, digital citizens online, consume quality information, media literacy online. And now they need to also create. Because it's one thing to learn online. It's another to be understood as such. So if you're learning and creating and collaborating and sharing and talking to professionals and all that online, like, that's what we want. That's it to be understood as such by creating and participating. How do we get them to participate? Well, that's where I get to digital portfolios, uh, and that's that create over spectate. This is my student, Wes. Um, I'll talk about him more in a second. This is his digital portfolio. Even if he's a crappy filmmaker, no matter what, an employer who sees that digital portfolio is like, that takes effort, initiative, creativity, professionalism, ambition. I like this guy, Wes. Huge step one. I mean, it's not if our students get Googled when they apply for jobs, it's when. So let's help them with that. And we have to, because they all have a digital footprint, whether we like it or not. In fact, um, almost a quarter of children begin their digital lives when parents upload their prenatal sonogram scans to the internet. The study also found that 92% of toddlers under the age of two already have their own unique identity online. They're already there. They already have a digital footprint. You know, let's help them make that into a 
beautiful digital portfolio. And then how, back to the Philly memes, let's get into it. Right now, this is how we teach digital citizenship. I, I've been generalizing, right? Should you post that? If you ever asked a kid, if you've ever done this, um, before a kid has posted something stupid, say, hey, should you post that? They get it right. With you, a mentor, in a space where you're connecting with them, they get it right. That same thing happens, especially if you're a teacher that signs essays, and say, hey, is this a good source? This would be media literacy instruction. The kid starts to think about it, no, nah, actually maybe it's not, or maybe it is, here's why, right? They get these questions right in a lab with a mentor who cares and is asking them. So what I'm getting at is actually we need to think, rethink that whole thing. We need more than one person um, teaching digital citizenship and media literacy, um, whether it's you know, the history teacher that's asking if it's a good source or, or the counselor that's asking whether or not they should post something. We as a community need to do that. All teachers need to be doing that. And this is really important. Digital citizenship and media literacy cannot be taught in a lab. They have to be lived. So you can teach a kid how to fact check, but he's not going to do it. How do we make them always do it? Well, and that's why I'm talking about it. it has to be through social media, it has to be through that network, and it has to be based on passion. So here's how I've done that. This is my um, mass media class. I started it with a network of journalists and filmmakers and graphic designers and all those things on Twitter. And then I said, well, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna go into this industry, you have to write articles and post them. You have to be able to manage social media accounts, Instagram, Twitter. And you have to be able to put up podcasts. So I, as the teacher, was the host for their digital portfolio, if you will, where they had to post all of their work and they had to put it all up. You can do it under a pseudonym. If your district doesn't allow it, right? No problem. Um, but I was hosting it for a while. And this is what I got after the class ended. Right? So Wes wrote those articles for me. He recorded those articles for me. And three years later, or this is four years later, this is where he was. So the skills that he picked up in a silly mass media class it just so happened that Wes was interested in being a filmmaker. And so he used those skills and that podcast that he created and those videos he made and he now has this digital portfolio next year he's gonna apply for a job and he's gonna get them. These two girls were also in that class and they didn't like the film unit as much as they liked the journalism unit. And they wanna be journalists. And so this is their digital portfolio. It's actually remarkable, remarkably similar on two different platforms, but here's all my writing. Here's my photography. Here's the videos I've shot. Here's who I am and here's my resume. Hire me. And they're going to apply for jobs next year and they're going to get jobs. That was my mass media class. But this can happen in any class. So one of my colleagues teaches a class called Evolution of the Biosphere. And his kids, um, they, he has curated and sent and shared stuff that they're going to cover in the class. Um, and at the end, he makes them do a poster presentation. And he's like, this is what professional scientists do at their poster presentation. And then he said, in groups, he's like, hey, that, that team that's doing Life on Mars, that's doing their poster presentation on Life on Mars, you should read this. And then at the end, you know, they, they did their poster presentations and he shared it. Um, so this was a great way to say, if you like the content of this course, you can continue to learn about it online. Um, and actually, the, some of the research you need to do to complete this poster project is current. One way to find it is on Twitter. This is my history class. I taught a contemporary world history class. Um, and the same thing I did with that mass media class. I put a list of 100 people putting out international news and, and tangentially related fields. Um, and then I did this. These are all the things we're gonna cover in the class, like human rights, education, literacy, uh, healthcare, yada, yada, all these things we're gonna come across as we study contemporary world history. You tell me which ones of these things you're interested in, and then anytime I find an article, and they like crime. Anytime I find an article about crime, I'm gonna click that heading, copy those emails, paste it, send that article. And then by the end of the class, you tell me really what you're interested in. You don't want to learn about the, you know, the news I'm, I'm sharing with you about crime? You can unsubscribe, right? But what of this class are you interested in? And then where do you find more of that? And I'm like, I got you. So this was several years ago, and my kids still come up to me. I got a note, actually, when, from a senior who graduated who was like, I still open that Twitter when there's international breaking news. And I still use the network that you built for me to learn about international news two years later. I'm like, cool, I wish you told me, because <laughs> we could have built a better one, we could have worked together, right? Like, you know, I could have helped you create a digital portfolio, right? And, and, so, you know, which things I wish. This is uh, my student, Alan, um, and he, civic engagement, he thought we didn't have enough school spirit. And so what he did is he started doing top 10 videos, like ESPN, because he wants to be a sports broadcaster, 
Uh, and then he started putting them on YouTube. And this was his learning about trying and experimenting with um, becoming a commentator, career opportunity, civic engagement, getting his kids interested in um, school spirit. One of my other science teachers decided that he was disappointed that his AP physics students would pour endless hours into their lab journals and then throw them out at the end of the year. So he was like, well, let's put them online. And so then he made them put all of their AP physics labs online, uh, which again, creates a wonderful digital portfolio for them. Um, and it's super fun, and it actually then helps the students the following year. Um, and it becomes a perpetuating learning opportunity for these kids. And then I took this all the way to the extreme, and I now teach a class called Passion Based Learning for Social Media. And I had a girl who loves poetry and travel, and it wasn't really like cool to like talk about those things in high school. But she found a place to do that um, through Weebly, uh, and this is her website where she learns about that stuff. And I had this kid who wanted to learn about marketing, but we don't have any classes on marketing or advertising. So I helped her build a network, and she built this website, and she actually calls it digital marketing for teens, or by teens, and she tries to help other people who want to get into marketing and how to, how to do it. She shares resources, talks about her process, etc. And that comes off of my course called Passion Based Learning for Social Media, as I said. And I just ask that they do these things. That they learn, curate, create, share, collaborate, and lead in this space. And if they do that, you can have your A, right? But it's all public and it's all there. I'll highlight that collaborate phase because the next slide is about that. I had a student who's interested in animal cruelty. So she built this website about organizations that are stopping animal cruelty. So then she reached out to PETA. She was like, I'm doing this website. I'm learning about these things. Hey, can, can I interview you? Can we chat? And they're like, yeah. So she interviewed PETA and put it on her website. And I had this student who was interested in getting more girls into coding. And so she read a book about it. And she reached out to them. And they're like, yeah, let's talk. And then she found this organization that places coders. And she was like, hey, can I talk to you about how you place coders into the gender disparity? And they're like, yeah, let's talk. So now she has these interviews up on her website. So that was a throw a lot at the wall of examples. Um, and I tried to sort of distill what made those examples good for creating networks and sharing work online. Um, and, I, and this is what I sort of boiled it down to. I said, how many of your assignments are professional, publishable, personalized, real world, and collaborative? And I seriously would love to like, sort of audit courses through sort of this perspective. Um, in the same way that in that opening activity, I would seriously love every teacher to have to build a network that they put in their syllabus. Um, and I wonder how far we'd get with this, if we could get a lot of teachers doing that. Uh, I think that would be, I think every teacher can do that. Uh, I think that would get us a long way. And then I think you'll probably also know that inevitably, um, I'm not saying that you should follow your students in social media. I'm not even saying that they shouldn't be social on social media. I'm just saying that they have to be able to see another way. So when I start this class on social media, and all of them for that matter that I've talked about, my, my history one, my journalism one, my passion-based learning social media one, my internet inequality one, in all of them, I say, don't use your personal Instagram, your personal Twitter. I don't care. Like, be social in that space by all means. But create something new so you can see the power of social media and how you can use it to be an active, informed citizen that's consuming quality content and then creating and sharing that quality content with experts. And so I think it's actually, this is the way I've been putting it recently to my students, I think it's actually about ratios. So how often, when you get on your social media networks, are you networking with experts or groups of critical thinkers? And how often are you networking with your friends? Again, you can do both. What's the percentages here? Same thing with, with your time online. How often are you on that professional account, that school account, that learning account, that career opportunity account? How often are you on that account? And how often are you on your Finsta, right? And then consumption and creation, same thing. How often when we're consuming, are we learning? You know, and are we an active, informed citizen? And how often are we consuming, are we that passive, entertained consumer? Right? And if we could sort of see it through this lens. And then creation, how often are we creating and collaborating in that professional learning space uh, and how often uh, are we just consuming? Um, so this is, I know this sounds, I know this sounds pathetic, but like, even if we could just get our kids in the green here for 10% of their time when they go on social media, that'd be huge. Absolutely huge. Um, and I think that's what my classes do. Um, and that's why I'm so excited to, to share some of the work that my students have done, to show you that it works. 
Do I reach every one of my students? No. Um, and do I get them all on the green, all of them on the screen thing for five, ten percent of the time? No. Um, but every time I reach someone, uh, it makes this, this colossal difference because that kid has this aha moment. That's like, if that's 16, 17, 18, whenever I find something I'm really interested in, and I realize that I can just take off and learn about it, connect with others that are learning about it, share my work. When I engage with someone, an adult, an expert in the field, etc. I am so much more articulate about the problems of that field or, or the open doors in that field or uh, things I've read recently um, that when, and I, this is what I then tell them, I say, well, when you graduate from college with the same degree as someone else, but for the last six years you've been reading about, learning about, investigating this space, you're going to get that job. Right? You're going to be more equipped uh, to make a difference in that career, industry, you know, what have you, because of your time spent doing what, what I'm talking about in this presentation. Um, and that, I think, uh, really resonates with them, and that's also the sort of aha moments for me, is when I see my kids really succeed and see, the, see that sort of like end goal coming. Um, and that's why I, I'm excited that I've been doing it long enough now to share those digital portfolios of Wes and Kayla and Katie, who, have had, who had me four years ago, and are still doing what, what I was having them do in my class. Um, I sincerely appreciate you being a great audience and coming to this last session. Uh, if this meant something to you, hit me up, let me know. And please uh, take the, sur take the like, survey about this presentation because next year I'd like to do this again and I don't want to be the last slot on the last day. <laughs> so if I can give you a little love on the survey, I'd appreciate it. Uh, so thank you so much for being a great audience. Uh, I hope to connect with all of you later.